All right, all right, all right. Uh, let's, uh, let's do a quick recap. Uh, we started off in Romans chapter one, two weeks ago. We talked about that, you know, in pursuing power, what is the very power of God? The very power of God is what? The gospel, the good news of Jesus. Why? Because it reveals something. What does it reveal? It reveals something different than man had, mankind had never experienced before. Mankind had never seen this revealed, which is what? The righteousness of God in you and I. See, mankind was living under this law that didn't reveal man's righteousness or a way to righteousness. It revealed man's sin. And when we were under this law, we were stuck in this place of not knowing who we are. And so the only thing we can do is work to get to a place of obtaining righteousness. And then Jesus shows up and destroys religion and this whole concept of what everyone had an idea of and said, guess what? Righteousness is a gift now. Receive it. That is the very power of God. Last week, we saw the power of the Holy Spirit to transform us by beholding the goodness of the Lord. And today, the message on pursuing power stems from a conversation I had with someone uh, several months ago. He's actually a, 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 like a small group leader or, um, you know, like he held his own Bible study. Um, he done time in Bible school. And um, so I'm obviously a believer and stuff. And we were having a conversation and he was like, Josh, I mean, I, I, I'm tithing, I'm, I'm giving, I'm serving, I'm, I'm reading my Bible, I'm praying. Why am I not experiencing God's blessing? Why is life such a struggle? Why is Christianity so difficult, so hard? Now, I was in his shoes too, asking God, why is Christianity so dang difficult? I mean, you show up at church and you've got this long list of rules now of what you can do and what you can't do. Good luck, right? So we get this list of rules and everything and we try to live by them and we just fail. And instead of having the new system of Jesus, we're still under the old system of law, which is what this young man was still under. I said, it's still a struggle because you're still living under the law, which is what it was designed to. It was designed to make life a struggle for you. So you'd look for some help so that you would be like, dude, I need some help. God, what are you going to do? And God says, I'm sending you my son, Jesus. But if he never gave us the law and we never experienced the struggle, we would have never valued Jesus to the degree that we do. See, when we don't uphold the standard of the law and see the law as something that is so perfect and holy and impeccable, unless we see it the way God designed for us to see it, we won't understand the true deliverance from it that Jesus brings. But when we preach the law as something that is that we are able to maintain, able to follow and perfectly obey, we lowered the standard of law and now Jesus is not nearly as valuable as when I couldn't keep the law. Does that make sense? Good. So let's... Uh, the, so I, I started talking to the guy and I basically said, dude, you know, because a lot of us find ourselves in this place of we're praying to God for something and we haven't seen the answer yet. Anybody ever experienced that? And, and, and a lot of times it, it, we're wondering, well, what's God doing? What, am I not doing something? Am I supposed to be doing, is there, is there a disconnect between, you know, like why haven't I got the answer yet? In other words, why am I still struggling? And so tonight's message is to answer that for you about what you do in the process, in the moment, what life is all about. And it's actually really simple. It's a simple word called relax. <laughs> what are you doing? What are you supposed to do when the answer's not there? You are supposed to relax. But that's the hardest thing for humans to do. We don't want to rest and relax. I need to do something. If God told me, Josh, all your prayers will be answered, climb Mount Everest. Guess what? I'm on the next plane in Nepal and I'm gonna climb Mount Everest. It's simple, it's easy. But when God says, stand still and I will deliver you, that's difficult. Why? Because the armies are surrounding me. I gotta do something, I gotta run. And God says, no, stand still. It's the little opposite. You know, the, the fires of life are going to come. 
We pray, and this is our prayers all the time. We pray, God, don't let the fires come. Don't let the problems come. Don't let the issues of life come. And when they come, we feel condemned and guilty like God didn't answer our prayer. But God's not looking to answer that prayer because unless the fire comes, how is the world gonna see that there's a God that actually loves you? See, because the fire's gonna come to the world and the fire's gonna come to you. The only difference is the fire doesn't burn you. But how's the world going to know that there's a God who's alive, who's resurrected and loves you? Unless we encounter the fire too. See, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were facing certain death by getting thrown into the fire. They didn't pray, God, deliver, uh, God, don't let us get thrown into the fire. They told Nebuchadnezzar, dude, no matter what, we ain't bowing to you. Go ahead, throw us in the fire. Our God will deliver us. And so guess what? Nebuchadnezzar said, okay, fine, I'm so mad. I'm going to heat up the fires uh, seven times hotter. And he took his mighty men. Why would he send his mighty men, his most mighty men in his army to throw the three Hebrew children into the fire? Because he's actually probably a little nervous that this Yahweh might come through. So he's going to send his toughest guys to make sure they get thrown into the fire. But see, what happens is when you actually get thrown into the fire of life, like we saw last week with Peter walking on the water, the waves and the storm didn't stop when he walked on water. He walked above the problems. See, when you get thrown into the fire, there's someone else in there waiting for you. His name is Jesus, the fourth man who was in there with having a Bible study with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The fire didn't harm them. The only thing the fire did in their life was burn the bonds that binded them. Wow, this God is amazing. But see, we've been praying, God, God, I don't want this fire. Stop the problems from coming to me. No, you'll be like Joshua and Caleb when you understand Jesus and say, bring the problems on, they're bread for me. There's a conquering mindset and there's a victim mindset. God doesn't create victims. God creates conquerors. Amen. So we're resting. Now, the, one of my favorite things about, I'm off track here. I had a plan like, all right, I got to get this in 20 minutes and then this and this, but, but I'll, I'll speed through. So I, I talk fast sometimes Just stay with me as I got to. Okay. Um, so, uh, God creates all these Bible pictures through the Bible. The Old Testament's filled with faith pictures. And I love it because I'm a picture oriented person. I'd rather read a book than see the movie. Is anybody else like that? Like you love using your imagination. That's me hundred percent. I like to put myself in the story. I like to see my surroundings and, and visualize what's going on and really feel the impact of what's happening in the situation. That's the way I am. And so God throughout the whole Old Testament and the New Testament, he's creating pictures for you to see who Jesus is. So Jesus is being revealed all throughout the law, all throughout the old covenant, he's being revealed to us. Now, everything that's revealed in the old covenant in the Old Testament is a picture of Jesus on the inside. What I'm I'm about to explain. So we see in Exodus, uh, if you want to go there, Exodus chapter 28. Now, this is a picture of the high priest of Israel. Now, quick backstory, what a high priest is different than a prophet. A prophet is someone that is before God and God speaks to the prophet and the prophet goes and speaks to the people, okay? The high priest is one that represents the people to God, okay? So I'm gonna represent you, I'm the high priest, so I represent you to God. So what God is setting up is God is going to accept or deny you. He's going to favor and bless you or judge you entirely based on me. You say that's not fair, because what if I'm a bad guy? See, if Israel was a good nation, but the high priest was bad, guess what? They don't get blessed. Why? Because their high priest is evil. But if the nation of Israel is bad, which obviously that's how it was every year, you know, but the high priest was good, guess what? You still get blessed. Jesus in Hebrews chapter seven is who? Our high priest. So no matter how bad you are, it is irrelevant to how God treats you because God treats you according to our high priest who is perfect and lives by the power of an endless life. That is our Jesus. And so Jesus intrinsically is this high priest outwardly. So God had these very specific instructions on what the high priest would wear. Notice this, verse nine of uh, chapter 28. You shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the children of Israel. Uh, Six of their names on one stone and the other six names of the rest of the other stone according to birth. Now, uh, throughout today, I'm gonna be reading from the translation, the M 
M as in mom, M-E-V translation. It's very similar to the New King James. It's just a little easier to read. So if you have your, uh, your Bible app or whatever, M-E-V. Uh, his translation is what I'm reading from. So anyway, so what he does is he has the high priest wear two stones that are on the shoulders. And on each shoulder are six of the names of the tribes of Israel listed on the shoulder. Now let's go uh, to uh, later verse. I think it's like 17 or something. The next, uh, next. Yeah, 19. The third. Okay, so now oh, we skip something. Go back. Uh, go to 15. Okay, you shall make the breastplate of judgment, the work of a skillful workman. You shall make it in the same manner as ephod. Okay, so let me just run through this. So God is describing this outfit that the high priest will wear. There's these two shoulder pads that are made of onyx stones that rest on the high priest's shoulder. And then there's this thing called the breastplate of judgment. And the breastplate of judgment is actually the most expensive piece of clothing that the high priest will wear. And he is to wear this, which is all these precious stones and gems that have the names of Israel and Engraved on them, which are over the high priest's heart. Now, this breastplate of judgment that is over the high priest's heart is connected by a golden braid to the two onyx stones. Now, Josh, what does all this mean? I know this can get boring, but it's actually super beautiful because it is a picture of what? Upon your shoulders is a picture of what? Strength and power. And then above the, over the heart is a picture of love. And it's not what Jesus is wearing today, but it's what Jesus, who Jesus is intrinsically, that Jesus carries you on his shoulders. Jesus left the 99 to find the one, and when he found the one sheep, what did he do? He picked the sheep up, carried him on his shoulders back, and then threw a party. Where's my works involved in that? I said, meh, okay, you can pick me up. And he carried me. See, you're still trying to carry yourself and carry your family and carry your business and carry, carry, carry as if you have the strength to do so. No, 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 no. Our high priest has the strength for you. Let him carry you. And you say, well, I don't know if God will carry me. I don't know if he wants to. Well, it just so happens to be that his strength and power is connected to that which he loves. See, you can't separate his power from his love. His love is only for, or I'm sorry, his power is only for those he loves. What is his power doing right now? It's working in you, Ephesians 1.18 says. Paul says this prayer to the church at Ephesus, that you might know the exceeding greatness, the unlimited amount of power that is at work in you. Right now, that's how much power is in you. And when we see this, who this Jesus is, it'll, create, it'll cause us to rest. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, what's interesting is the opposite word for ease is what? Disease. The opposite word of ease, actually, can you put that scripture back up? The opposite word for ease is disease. Now, look at what happens is who is he talking to? Whenever you read the Bible, you always have to know who's the context, what's the context? Who is this being written to? Who is he talking to? What is the situation going on? These people he's talking to are Jews who have been working and striving under the law for the past 1,500 years to obtain something. It's not that they're tired from working in their jobs. That's not the tiredness that Jesus is talking to. He's talking about you are carrying a burden that you can no longer carry. It has got you burdened down. Why? Because when you're under this law, it can't help but point out your faults. And so you're carrying around this guilt and shame your entire life. And Jesus says, don't go over there anymore. Come to me and I will give you rest. Why? Because when you come to Jesus, Jesus does the work on your behalf. Jesus is the one that went to war for us. So when we come to him, he gives us rest. And it's interesting that Jesus used the word yoke. 
A yoke is what you would use and you would put on two oxen or two bulls. It would go, uh, you know, they go through the neck here and then the other one would be here and they would use it to pull a plow. So Jesus is describing this picture of our life under the law of constantly stressed, constantly having tension, constantly striving, this tension of pulling and dragging without any rest. And then he says, my yoke is easy. So it's interesting because all of a sudden I realize that there's a different yoke. There's that yoke under the law. And then there's Jesus's yoke where it's me and Jesus together. And where actually Jesus does all the work and I'm just enjoying what he's done. See, we're, we're connected. I'm not relying on my strength. I'm relying on his strength. He goes before me. So you know how much tension I have? Zero. You know how much stress and anxiety I have? Zero. Now, stress and anxiety will try to attach itself to you. You'll constantly have the temptation to go back over here because it's so much easier to strive. It's so much easier to, to push through and to pull and to strive in life. Why? Because your flesh wants to boast in what you've done. And God said, let no man boast, but let our only boast be in the Lord. Our only boast in life is that you did it. Life becomes easy. And these people who have been living under law had a constant consciousness of what? The curse. Look at Galatians chapter three, verse 10. For all who rely on the works of the law are under the curse. Notice what Paul did not write here. He did not say all who disobey the law. He did not say all who disobey the law. He said all who rely on the works of the law. So this is a matter of what you're trusting in. This is all a matter of consciousness and attitude of what you're trusting in. Are you trusting in your abilities and your works? Or are you trusting in his? All who rely on the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, curses everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Guys, it's a losing effort. The law wasn't given so that we could you know, say, look at, look at how well I did. And I, I know that, you know, I used to be that way years ago. It's been a long time, but, you know, I, I tried real hard not to sin. You know, I was, uh, I was Mr. Holy dude, you know, and I, I would see someone in sin and I'd be like, you're just not trying hard enough. I, I'm sweating day in and day out, keeping this, this balloon underwater from exploding. And you're just freely going out and sinning. That's not fair. And so I condemn him. I condemned her. Why? Because I'm fighting so hard to not sin. And they're just out doing whatever. Well, we're both wrong because neither of us are, have our eyes on Jesus. See, but when you get your eyes off of holding this balloon underwater, trying to suppress the flesh, and you just waltz over here into Jesus, who is that spirit, you walk in total freedom. You're not only is there no balloon underwater, you're out of the water and everything. It's just a life of freedom. It's a completely different consciousness in life under the law where we're always conscious of the curse. What does that mean? We're always conscious of God's punishment. We're always conscious of God turning his back on us. We're always conscious of God giving us retribution for what we deserve. And that's normal. That's what guilt is. You do something wrong and you feel guilty, it's you feeling like you need to punish yourself. That there's something you need to go through in order to gain acceptance with God again. That does not bring God any pleasure. Look what Jesus said in Galatians 3, 14, 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by being made a curse for us as it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. You know why we don't have to be Christ, uh, curse conscious anymore? You know why we're not under the law anymore? Because Jesus set us free from it. Jesus on that cross became a curse. It wasn't something pretty. See, we still can experience a curse on this world. You say, but Josh, I, I, I still, I'm experiencing the curse. I, I, I'm trying to get out of it. What do I do to get rid of this curse? What did God say to Moses to do to get rid of the curse? God told Moses, get a pole and make a brass serpent and put that serpent wrapped around the pole and whoever looks to the pole will be healed. Because the curse can't be two places at once. Either you've believed and you've allowed Jesus to receive your curse or you're taking it yourself. Uh, I could use a little bit more encouragement. <laughs> no. 
Jesus became a curse for us. Like, do you ever stop and think about what I just said? Like, do you realize we all deserve the curse? I mean, we deserve more than the curse. We literally said, God, thanks for creating us. Not really. Bye. And, and in order, you know, God could have just been like, well, that one failed. Let's start over. Right? I mean, I mean, let's think about what he loses if he decides right after Adam and Eve fall. He loses two created beings. They don't reproduce. Let's just start over. Let's, let's close Eve's womb so they can't reproduce and we'll start over over here in another universe or something. But in order for, for me, because that's not when God thought of you when you were born. Oh, man. See, God has been thinking of you for millions and millions and millions of years. And the moment you're born into this earth is not the day that God's finally like, okay, now I'm aware of you. So it wasn't just Adam and Eve that were alive in that garden. It was all of you and I. And God wasn't interested in starting over. He was interested in redemption. He was interested in revealing his nature of love and mercy rather than judgment. So instead of just starting over and with creation, all it was was a breath for him, but to redeem us, it took him to bleed and be tortured to death. And he chose that avenue. Jesus became the curse for us. I won't allow the curse in my family. It doesn't belong there. Whenever the curse tries to attach itself, I will not accept it. I'm not saying I'm in denial about it. I'm not ignoring it. What am I doing? I'm saying, curse, you belong on that cross. Jesus already carried it, and I'm not going to carry it because I can't. I wasn't designed to be cursed. I wasn't designed to carry the curse. It was upon Jesus. In Romans chapter 4, Paul writes, now to him who works, wages are not given as a gift, but as a debt. See, God's not interested in what you can earn and deserve. You know, when, I, when Christmas time comes and I get gifts for people, I can just imagine I buy my wife something, I give, uh, you know, it's wrapped, it's under the tree and she opens it, she's happy. And then she says, oh, she takes out her checkbook and says, how much was that? And wants to give me a check for it. I say, no woman, it's a gift. Because if I was to take that check, if I was to, if she was to do something to earn it, she robs me of my gift. She's robbing me of love. Because when she got it based on her earning it, it's no longer a gift. What is it? It's payment. You go to work. You guys know what payment is. You go to work Monday through Friday. You do your work and you're expecting a paycheck at the end of the week. You're not thinking, man, that's a, such a nice company. They are so gracious and giving. That's not what's running through your mind. You're like, you better give me that check. It was a day late. You're in the, you know, the office pounding on the door. Like, where the heck is my money? See, God will have none of that. It's not based on what you've earned or deserved. It's based entirely on what Jesus did. So that why? It can all be a gift. So that we can say thank you. So that we can say wow. So that we can enjoy life in the goodness of the Father, not in the the works of Josh. It's complete and total freedom. Look at the next verse in verse five. But to him who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. So we see then if it's not my works, what is it I do? What is it I do if there's nothing for me to do because it's all been accomplished, what is left for me to do? Believe. Look at what Jesus said in John chapter six. Then they asked him, Jesus, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? The people, they're works conscious. And what did Jesus say? This is the work of God. That what? That you believe in him whom he sent. This is what he wants from you. He wants your trust. He wants you to believe in Jesus. He wants you to honor him by honoring the son. He wants you to believe in how good he is. He doesn't want you trusting in your works because they always end in bad. He wants you trusting in him. He wants you trusting in Jesus. And look at the result of what happens when you believe right. Hebrews chapter four, verse three. 
for we who have believed have entered his rest. See, that gentleman's Christianity and life was a struggle. Why? Because he just wasn't believing right. It wasn't that he wasn't saved. It wasn't that he didn't have the grace of God in his life. It wasn't that God wasn't there. It was that his believing was off. And when your believing is off, you will live wrong. Because we live from the inside out, not from the outside in. It's what we believe in our heart. Out of our heart flow the issues of life. If you're not happy with the issues of life and how things and your perspective of things, check your heart. Belief, believing right always leads to relaxation with God. Hebrews chapter four, verse 10. For whoever enters his rest will also cease from his own works as God did from his. Cease from his own works as God did from his. There are no more works left for us to do. There is no more striving. There is no more trying to obtain something. It has already been obtained. You and I get to rest on his shoulders. You and I get to rest in what Jesus did. And when you believe that, your life will become a place of peace and rest. If you have your Bibles, open up to Luke chapter 13. I want you to see a couple of these stories. Luke 13, verse 10. Everybody okay? Everyone resting? Good, good. All right, verse 10. Jesus, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity for 18 years and was bent over and could not straighten herself up. When Jesus saw her, he called her and said, woman, you are loose from your infirmity. Then he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath and said to the people, there are six days in which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on those days, but not on the Sabbath day. The Lord answered, you hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead it away to water? Then should not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound these 18 years, be loosed from this bondage on the Sabbath? When he had said this, all his adversaries were ashamed and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Now I want you to see what just took place here. Jesus is teaching in his church and all of a sudden he has a word of knowledge about this woman that's probably seated in the back, you know, because the woman in those days, they were segregated. They had to sit back there and all that. And uh, he has this word of knowledge about this woman that has had this infirmity for 18 years. Now, I want you to look at what this, first of all, what this number 18 represents. If we divide 18 by three, we come up with what? Six, six, six. And we see that it's the devil that bound her. So this is an attack of the enemy. We notice where this attack came from. It didn't come from God. It came from who? The devil. This is a demonic oppression and Jesus showed up to destroy the works of the devil, which included making this woman straight. So here's this woman that the devil has attacked and has her bent over and she's been this way for 18 years. Now I want you to see the spiritual connection here of what's going on. Where is her perception and what is her consciousness? Being bent over, what is she seeing all day long? The dust of the earth. The devil's interested not just in making you sick or ending your life early, but ruining your consciousness from seeing the goodness of Jesus, which we saw last week, to having a dust consciousness. What is a dust consciousness? A mere human experience without God. When Adam and Eve sinned, what did God say to Adam? Dust you are and dust you return. What happened to being crowned with the glory and honor that he was five minutes ago, naming the animals and everything? Sin destroyed that relationship to now it's human apart from God. What did he tell the devil to the serpent? On your belly, you shall crawl in the dust and eat dust the rest of your life. What did he tell Adam? He said, because of you, the dust of the earth is cursed. What is this woman's perspective? What is the devil doing? The devil is trying to get her perspective of life off of Jesus onto what? The curse, mere humanity apart from Jesus. She's dust conscious. She's eating from the wrong thing. 
Jesus is our bread of life. We are meant to feed off of Jesus. And the devil, what he will do is he's going to bring memories and he's going to attack your mind of things you've actually done. He's not going to bring to your attention things you haven't done because what kind of, I didn't do that. So you can't really like bug me with that. But of sins you've done in the past, he will bring up and condemn you with them. Something you've done maybe yesterday, maybe a week ago, maybe a year ago. These are the fiery darts of the wicked. He shoots these into your mind and says, yes, you're praying to God about this, but look what you did last week. Look what you just did five minutes ago. Look at what you're still doing. Look at your mind. Look at you, look at you, look at you, look at you. And what happens is eventually you were like this because you came to encounter and your eyes were on Jesus and all of a sudden you got home and you're like, yeah, but remember that? And then slowly you end up bent over and your full consciousness and perspective of life is back into mere humanity, back to the curse. And now your entire expectation is you're expecting the curse and you're expecting the curse. You know what happens to those people? It's so sad. Jesus never stopped blessing them. Jesus never stopped doing anything, but you stop seeing them here. They stop coming to church. It's not because the world is so powerful. It's like, yeah, let's go out in the world and party up and, you know, let's just do crazy stuff. No, 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 no. The, word's not, the world is not scary at all compared to Jesus. I, I, my biggest pet peeve is comparing Jesus with the world. See, when you get a glimpse of Jesus, the world has absolutely nothing on Jesus. Jesus is so much bigger and more beautiful and satisfying than anything the world has to offer. The people leave church and they don't want to go to church. Why? Because they feel guilty. They feel condemned that they're, they've become so conscious of their sin instead of conscious of Jesus. They don't want to come here into the light because they feel that the light of God is going to shine and show all their ugliness. I know, have you ever gone into like a prophetic meeting where there's a guy that moves in like the words of knowledge or something and you didn't want to go in there because you were afraid he was going to call out your sin? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> hey. Yeah, that, those were like terrifying moments. Like, please don't give me a word. Please don't give me a word because I don't want to know my sin or something, you know? Like, that's what God's thinking about, your sin. No, that's the attack of the enemy trying to get your consciousness off of Jesus back onto what you've done, what you've not done. And that's where you had this woman for 18 years. And Jesus showed up. Man, when Jesus shows up, I'm telling you, your encounter with Jesus is everything. It is life changing. Jesus shows up, sees this woman and says, not, not another moment you will be in this condition. Not another moment, not another second. It is over right now because I am here. Your perspective doesn't have to take a week to change. It can change right now by getting your eyes on Jesus. And he shows them and says, woman, you are loose. And not only does he speak that powerful word from a distance, but he wants to know, he wants her to know that he is present. He is here with her. He is in the now. He sees her condition and he is there. And he comes over and he touches her embraces her and she becomes straight up. And now who's she beholding? She's beholding the glory of the Lord. She's beholding the goodness of the Lord being transformed into his very image. No longer is she conscious of who she's not, but now she's conscious of Jesus and what? His goodness, how good he is. But in that same episode, you think all the people would be like, yeah, that's so amazing. We just witnessed a miracle. Now, look, they know it was a miracle because this woman's been in their place for 18 years. So we can see that in this place of the law being preached, there was no hope. There was no change. Why? Because the ruler of the synagogue is angry. What a pastor. Angry that one of his congregants just got healed. Why? Because... The law says you can't do anything on the, on the Sabbath. So this man saw healing, saw the working miracle power of God as a what? As a work. How many of us? Yes, I heard it's God's will for me to be well. I heard it's God's will for me to prosper. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? We look at God's power as if it's a work. We're looking to work for it. When Jesus shows up, Jesus calls the guy that says, there, there are six, day in which man, six days in which man ought to work. Let them come then and be healed. And Jesus says what? You hypocrite. I love Jesus. What a man. I mean, just straight up. The dude like gets up like he's going to be tough to Jesus. Come on, dude. And, and he's like talking to Jesus. No, there's six days in which man ought to be healed. And he calls him out in front of everybody. You hypocrite. This is the ruler of the synagogue. This is a dude who's prideful in his works. 
He just got humbled, man. He just got thrown down. And Jesus says, how many of you, if you have an ox or a donkey, will not untie it and lead it to water? Now notice the the perspectives. You have the woman who is human perspective, sin conscious, curse conscious. You have the man, the, the ruler of the synagogue, who is works conscious. And now you have Jesus, what is what conscious? He says, ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham? Did you catch that? Not what she's done or what she's going to do, but who she is based on what? Based on what Jesus says she is. You didn't hear me. Because when you understand who Jesus says you are, there's rest. You're done. Colossians 2.10 says what? You are complete in Christ. There is nothing more to add. There is nothing more for you to improve on. You are perfect. You are complete. And now the more you understand what Jesus is saying about you, we start seeing more of the fruits of righteousness in your life, more fruits of holiness in your life. And now after some time of meditating on who Jesus says you are and resting in what he says you are and who he says you are, what's happening? The miracle power of God is flowing in your life. And then all of a sudden your friends see you and say, man, you're a different person than you were like a week ago. Like, man, you're not doing this. You're not doing that. What's going on with you? And you're like, dude, Jesus changed my life. Yeah, I've heard that before. But that's all what happens is you start focusing on what Jesus says. Jesus did this when? On the Sabbath. He's rest conscious. It's not about your works. It's not about what you can do. It's about who he is and who he says you are. He said she was a daughter of Abraham. Ought not she be made well? And notice He said, on the Sabbath. So meditating on this, I was like, you know, we talk about God's timing, God's timing, at God's timing, at God's timing. Well, Jesus is pretty clear about God's timing here. When was his timing? It was on the Sabbath. What does that mean? He says, when you rest. God's timing is when you rest. I know, okay, maybe you you don't believe me. Maybe you don't. God's timing is when you rest. Because look, we're not dealing with a God that deals with lateral time. Remember last week, what did we see? When Jesus showed up to Martha, he had to correct her theology about time and say, no, 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 no. I'm not gonna be the resurrection in the life. But truly and factually, he would resurrect in the future. But Jesus said, no, I am the resurrection and I am the life. See, the sooner you see who you are in him and who he is right now, that faith is now the substance of things hoped for, that's when you enter rest. And when you enter rest is when his power flows. So I wanna enter rest. What did Hebrews 4, 13, uh, 11 say? Therefore, let us labor to enter into rest. Our only work, our only fight, my only effort is to continue resting. What a, what a religion. What does your religion teach? Uh, relaxation. <laughs> Go to Luke 15, and I'm closing with this. Now this... This next part wrecked me for like two days, no joke. Whoa, like, um, sometimes this is a very popular, common, I am sweating. Oh my gosh. Oh my, I'm sorry, I gotta, Angela. Angela was watching my video from last week and I was like, hey, what are you doing? She's like, I'm watching your video from last week. I'm like, oh, wow, that's so cool. But I'm critiquing you. She's like, you, 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 were, you were changing the scriptures and you bent over and your hair just got all messy and it looked really unprofessional. I'm like, yeah, thanks, babe. Appreciate it. I'm glad you got the point of the message. But they're only there to make you better. It's only because she cares about me. But this is a very common parable, and uh, perhaps how I'm about to share it with you is the first time you've ever heard it this way. I know it was for me um, the other night. Uh, uh, Verse 11, it's the parable of the prodigal son. Now, this is Jesus talking. Let's remember, this is Jesus. The words are read. Verse 11, then he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that falls to me. So he divided his estate between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and journeyed to a distant country and there squandered his possessions in prodigal living. 
When he had spent everything, there came a severe famine in that country and he began to be in want. So he went and hired himself to a citizen of that country who sent him into his fields to feed swine. He would gladly have filled his stomach with the husks that the swine were eating, but no one gave him any. When he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have an abundance of bread and here I am perishing with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he arose and came to his father, but while he was yet, a, uh, while he was yet far away, the father saw him and was moved with compassion and ran and embraced his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put on a ring on his, on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring here the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to be merry. So the story starts out with two brothers and one of them takes the inheritance that is rightfully his and what does he do with it? He squanders it. He blows it. I want you to correlate that with Adam and Eve and what, not just Adam and Eve, but mankind, what we were given. We were given everything in the garden. There was no lack. And what did we do with it? We squandered it. We, sold, we, 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 we destroyed God's plan, if you want to say. We, we put everything that God gave us and said, you know what? No, I'm going to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil why? Because I want to be able to deserve by knowing what to do that's good and knowing what not to do that's bad. So no longer am I just trusting in you, but now I'm trusting in me and my ability to navigate the bad and good of life. See, we, we look at like eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is like something we don't do daily. Let me explain. When you have a conversation with someone for the first time, how many of you can't leave their presence until they know your stance or opinion on a certain subject. Right, why? Because we are so conscious of right and wrong. You're wrong, I'm right. Everyone has an opinion on everything and everybody thinks they're right. We're so focused on right and wrong, we've missed life. The tree of life over here Jesus is interested in life, in him living through you. It's not about you figuring out what's right and wrong. It's about figuring out Jesus. It's about knowing him and allowing Christ to live through you, Christ to live in you and allow him to guide your life. See, I don't need the law anymore and external uh, the rules and commandments. Why? Because I have the Holy Spirit guiding me now. But as long as I say over here with the law, with this telling me what to do, I'm not relying on the Holy Spirit. It requires no faith. It requires no grace. Over here, it just requires my strength. You following? And so here the brother, he squanders it all. And then what happens is he goes and finds a job and he becomes a slave, a servant, and he starts working for money. Now understand this. He grew up in his father's house and this is probably his first job. He grew up in his father's house where his father provided everything for him. But he thought he could make it out of the father's house. Man thought we could make it apart from God. So what does God do then? God gives us the law. He says, okay, you guys, you guys think you can make it without me. Here is my perfect holy law. Have at it. What does he do? He goes and gets a job. He becomes a servant to this man, and he ends up feeding swine. Now, to a Jewish person, to be in the presence of swine in that pen is absolutely unholy and unclean. You can't be around him. You can't touch him. And yet he is doing exactly what he doesn't want to do. Does that sound familiar, like Paul's experience under the law? Everything I don't want to do, I end up doing, and everything I want to do, I don't end up doing. Paul says, who will save me from this wretched man that I am? Oh, in Jesus Christ, I have freedom. That was a place to shout. <laughs> So he's serving and, and living in this, this pen. And notice what happens is he's becoming what? Hungry. He's not satisfied in this place under the law. He's not satisfied in this place of working, working, working to earn. He's earning a living. He's earning this. He's earning that. And what does he find himself in? He finds himself hungry and in want. See, the law was given so that we would hunger for something else. 
The, 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 the Old Testament prophets had a vision of what was to come, of the good things to come, but they themselves were not able to be partakers of that good thing. They were living in the shadow where Jesus today is the substance. We are the inheritors of that substance who is Christ. So the law was given so that we could become hungry, so that we would see our lack and our want, so we would start desiring the Father's house again. See, we tried life outside of God over here in my own strength, and God gave us law to show us we couldn't do it, and now I'm under this lack and want, so now guess what? I'm hungering back because I remembered when I was in the Father's house, I didn't have to earn. I didn't have to work for my food. My daddy took care of me. He took care of me in every area of life. Man, let me go back over there. But there's a problem, see, because he sinned. He did a very bad sin, so he's not just wanting to go back there, but he's also filled with this thing called guilt and shame. So what's his answer to guilt and shame? I know, I'll go ask him that I, that I can work for him. I, I'll, I'll answer this guilt and shame with work. He, he's in the pig pen and he's hungry, and he's thinking, I gotta go back there. Man, my father's servants are living better than me. I'm going to go ask him that I can be like one of his hired servants. If I can be like one of his hired servants and I'll work for a living, at least, you know, because he knows what I've done. He knows I lost everything and I blew it. What's amazing is he grew up in his father's house, but he still didn't know his dad. Because when he finally got the courage to go that direction, see, God's not looking for you to make it all the way. It's not like, the 90%, 10% kiss with your wife or whatever, where the man moves 90, she moves 10. It's not like that. It's literally one step in the right direction because he thought he was gonna have to answer for his shame. He thought he was gonna have to answer for his guilt, for his sin that he did. So he starts making his way back to the father, but he didn't know who his dad was, that his dad wasn't there thinking of punishment. His dad wasn't there thinking of judgment. His dad wasn't there thinking of scolding him and rebuking him and condemning him for what he did and saying, yeah, get in the, and start working. No, the father is sitting outside day after day after day after day. He wakes up in the morning. He goes out on the porch looking out on the horizon. He goes to bed at night. Everyone in the town is thinking, who's this crazy guy that won't stop looking for his lost son? Because all the father can think about is that lost son. That's all he can think about is that boy. He's not thinking about the things he did wrong. He's thinking about him. He's saying, I want him. And then one day the father's sitting there and he sees on the horizon a shadow, a figure coming towards him. And the father in those days, these Jewish men did not run. They didn't show expressions of emotion. They were dignified. But this father ain't dignified when it comes to love. He saw his son out there in the middle of everybody in the town, now going to look lowly upon him for showing his undignified self. He picks up his robe and he chases and runs after his son. And when he finds his son, what does he do? He jumps on him and grabs his neck and kisses him and embraces him. The son didn't know who his dad was until he sinned. What I find amazing is that that would have been awesome if Adam and Eve never sinned, but you realize we would have never known the true nature of God like we do today. It's because we sinned that we are able to see the true nature of God as mercy, love, and grace. See, this boy didn't know his dad until he came back after his sin. After his sin, after his mistakes, he came back to the father and now he's able to see who the father is because what does the father do? The boy is all ready to give his prepared speech. He says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and earth. I've sinned against you. And right before he can say, make me like one of your hired servants, the, the father has no need for that. The father, he interrupts his speech and says to his servants, get the rich robes and robe him. Get the ring and put it on his finger and put sandals on his feet. Why? Because if this boy was to work for it, he would be robbing the father of his nature of grace. He would be robbing his father of love. He would be robbing his father of mercy, which is what he delights in. 
Had he not sinned, he would have never fully known the true nature of God. But because of that which was evil, God turned it around for good to reveal his nature of grace to us. The rich robes of righteousness, he's restored to relationship with his dad. The ring of restoration of authority and power and the sandals on his feet, a restoration of holiness. And he did nothing but return home. And I was thinking, I see me in that story. I see the father in that story. I see the Holy Spirit, the servant. But where's Jesus? Right after the father closed his boy, he says to the servants, now bring the fattened calf that we may kill it and make merry. Where's Jesus in this story? Jesus is the fattened calf that has to die. See, the father didn't go light on sin. The father's not ignoring the son's mistakes and the son's sin. No, because why? He's a perfectly righteous judge. And if he was to ignore sin, he would immediately lose his place as perfect judge. But he's not interested in his son of going through the punishment and judgment. So instead of you and I going through the curse and going through his judgment, what does he do? He sends his son and gives him a body. Gives his son a body to bear our punishment, to bear our judgment. Jesus gave himself willingly to be arrested. Jesus gave himself to go and be mocked and humiliated and beaten where his beard was plucked out. They put a crown of thorns on his head and they beat him and they beat him. And the whole time there he's been getting beat, he's thinking, Josh gets that rich robe. Josh gets that ring. Josh gets those sandals on his feet. He's not gonna have to go through the punishment and judgment. Why? Because I'm enduring it right now. And then he goes to the skirt post and they, they whip him and they whip him and they whip him. Why? Because he is the lamb. He is the lamb who was slain from before the foundation of the world. And you know what's amazing is that when he hung on that cross, he took upon himself all the fiery indignation and wrath and judgment of God in his body that there is not one ounce of judgment left for any of us. So you can ignore your relationship with God as far as judgment goes because it's already been completely removed in Jesus. And when I look up at the throne today in Revelation, you know, it's not the lion of the tribe of Judah up there. Though it is, but when John heard, oh, it's the lion of the tribe of Judah, he turned and he didn't see a lion. What did he see? He saw the lamb. It's the lamb who conquered. It's the lamb who defeated. It's the lamb who did it all. And this is the fatted calf that's going to be killed. Why? So we can celebrate. Our life now is a life of rest and celebration with the father in his house where he provides it all. It's not for me to work because I would rob him of who he is. It's the lamb. And in heaven, when the lamb reveals himself and grabs a hold of the scroll to open it, all of heaven can't contain themselves. And they start rejoicing, worthy is the lamb, worthy is the lamb, worthy is the lamb. And now every day in life when I'm able to receive honor and glory for him, he does something through me. He encourages somebody. He blesses somebody. He does something through me. I get to say, thank you. You know, you say, thanks, Josh, for this or whatever. I say, you're welcome or whatever. I receive that honor from you. I receive that glory from you. And then I get to go to my private place and I get to bow before the king, the lamb, and cast my crown before him. Because the only reason I can do anything is because of Jesus. He is the only reason I am able to live. He is the only reason I have a relationship with the Father. And in him, there are no more works. He's not interested in what you can do. He's not interested in what you bring to the table. He's interested in you just being at the table. He will take care of the rest. The Holy Spirit in you, he trusts. He trusts the Holy Spirit in you to transform you and to remove that old man so that you don't have to worry about behaviors and addictions and things that, that, that you don't want a part of your life in them anymore. Just rest and let the Holy Spirit work. But you know, in that story, there was one other son, right? There were two. What is the other son doing? The other son sees the party going on and he gets angry. He gets angry at his father and says, you never threw me a party. He never killed the lamb for me. I have been working and serving you in the fields all these years and you've never done this for me. What's that son conscious of? Works. That son is busy in the fields working for his father. The other son 
now gets to see his father full of grace and enjoy the presence of the father because the fatted calf was killed. How many of us in here have been missing out on the party because we've been trying to bring our works? How many of us have been missing out on his presence, his love, his grace, his mercy? Because why? We've been so focused on our works and what we bring to the table. We're done with this verse, Galatians 3, 5. So then does God give you the spirit and work miracles among you by your doing the works of the law or is it by believing what you heard? If you're not resting, all I can say is start believing. Start hearing more so you can believe. Get home, open up that Bible, start finding out who Jesus is and who he says you are and you'll begin to rest. Amen? We're going to partake of communion now. or when worship starts and stuff. And Pastor Tom will come up in a minute. But I want you, as you take communion, and we're about to, this is Palm Sunday. You know, today is when Jesus walks into Jerusalem, the lamb. And in Exodus, God tells the, the children of Israel to go take a lamb from the flock, bring them into the house, keep them there for four days, and then on the fourth day, kill it. So Jesus did the same thing. Jesus being the lamb goes into Jerusalem for four days, and then he's killed. And why would God have them bring the, the little one-year-old lamb who's so cute and cuddly, and so just fun. All the little kids are playing with the lamb. Bring them into the house just so that four days later they can break everyone's heart by killing it. Because God wanted you to value the beauty of his son. God wanted you to value and see who it was that was gonna be killed on your behalf. What God gave up for you to have you, what his blood means and the value of his blood, that you are cleansed of all unrighteousness. Amen. Pastor Tom.